Okay, let's look at page 32. Now, if you look on, just real quick, if you look at page 33, that's actually, we've already talked about um, the, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, how they relate. And so you can, you can fill in that diagram with, in the Old Covenant column, it's God and then Israel and then the nations. And in the New Covenant, it's the same thing. It's just God, Jesus, and the nations. And the Old Covenant, if you want to draw a little Ten Commandments tablets between God and Israel, because that's how you're related. And in the New Covenant, you can draw a little heart between God and Jesus, um, and because that's how He relates to us in the New Covenant, is through writing the law in our hearts. And again, the passages that speak of this, the passages from the Old Covenant that point to a New Covenant coming, and that it would be a covenant of the heart, and it would be um, with the nation of Israel, and it, and it would not be in the replacement of Israel, and but it wouldn't be a whole new thing completely. It would be a continuation. Is Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, and Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 28. All right, let's look at some quick facts about the New Testament. <laughs> Got some bullet points here, just like we had about the Old Testament. So someone read it, and I will give you the blanks. Somebody take the first one. There are twenty-seven. Look, just make up the empty. Mm-hmm. Look, twenty-seven. How many in the Old Testament? Thirty-seven. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. How many in the whole Bible? Sixty-six. Sixty-six. You guys are going to be great on Jeopardy. Thirty-nine. Twenty-seven in the New Testament. Thirty-nine in the Old. Testament. Somebody read the next one. The full gospel. Gospels, you're right. Yeah. Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus' life from four slightly different perspectives. Yes, gospels. And here's what's really neat. Gospel means good news. The Greek word euangelion. It's a proclamation of good news. And gospel was not originally a Christian word. Uh, or even a necessarily religious word. A gospel was any, any like if there was a, a ruler, a Caesar, who did something amazing and wanted to tell everyone, he would issue a gospel, be written and sent throughout all of the land that he had done such and such. So Christians co-opted that term gospel because that very conveniently described exactly what Jesus' message was. Good news. Not Caesar's good news about a new water system he'd built or a battle he'd won, but Jesus' good news about him ushering in the kingdom of God and opening up the people of Israel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and language. So it was like the gospel with a capital G. And so the Christians adopted that language to describe these documents that were written. Alright, so I'm going to read the next one. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels because they have a lot of material in common. Much in, of it even verbatim. Synoptic means synoptic means see together. <coughs> so if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll see that sometimes if you read a passage in Matthew, then you read Mark, you can read the exact same passage. And sometimes even the word, word for word, is the same. And then you flip to Luke and you find the same passage in Luke as well. And so these are called the synoptics. And in New Testament scholarship, there's debate, as there always is about things, on what their relationship is. Most New Testament scholars would tell you that Mark was the first gospel written Almost any New Testament scholar. Very few would argue that Matthew's the first one, but but most across the board, conservative, liberal, secular, whatever, Mark was the first gospel, and that Matthew and Luke came later, with John coming much later. Now, in the 18 and early 1900s, it's very fashionable to date Matthew, Mark, and Luke to long after. Jesus was around. If you have a New Interpreter's Bible, Harper Collins Study Bible, any of those, they'll tell you that they weren't written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they weren't written during the lifetime of the apostles. They were written long after the time of Jesus. Well, there's the re there are a lot of reasons that people have held that, but the biggest reason is because Jesus says things in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in describing the fall of Jerusalem that are so pinpoint accurate that people have said, well, there's no way he could have known that in advance. These must have been written afterwards. 
unless he was Jesus, <laughs> who knew what was going to happen because he was God in the flesh. So, there's no good reason to date these super late. But anyway, one thing you find is that there are passages in Matthew that are also in Mark. Because they, they, well, Matthew used Mark as one of his sources in compiling the Gospels. No problem. And there are passages in Luke that are also in Mark. Because Luke, Luke tells us in his very first chapter that he went and interviewed and talked to a lot of people and tried to get all of the facts that he could. But then there are passages in Matthew and in Luke that aren't in Mark. And they come from nobody knows where. And so what scholars did was they called this source Q. And that's stuff that Matthew and Luke both have, but Mark doesn't. And so, and Q is, comes from the German word Kelle. Q-U-E-L-L-E, which just means source. And so this Q source took on a life of its own. You can go to a bookstore and you can buy the Gospel of Q. But what you're going to find is it's just a compilation of the stuff that Matthew and Luke have that Mark doesn't. And, and scholars have written whole dissertations on Q. The Jesus Seminar, which was a scholarly movement in the 80s and 90s, puts Q as the most authoritative of all the Gospels. The only problem, and it's a little problem, is that there's no shred of evidence that Q ever existed. It's, it's just a way of describing the material in Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark that scholars think goes back to an earlier source. But, but there's no evidence that it existed at all. There's a much simpler way to understand all of this without having to invent a Gospel of Q. The simplest way is to hold to what the Gospel themselves refer to and, and the time period that they themselves seem to imply they were written and say, Matthew used stuff from Mark, Luke used stuff from Mark, and then either Matthew or Luke used stuff from one or the other, whichever was written first. Most likely, Matthew was written after Luke. Problem solved. That accounts for the similarities and the stuff that they contain together. Stuff that when Matthew was writing his gospel, he used stuff from Mark. And then he used stuff that Luke used that Mark didn't use. And then sometimes he, I mean, so that you don't need to invent a Q document. You don't need to go searching for it. You can just, Occam's Razor takes care of this. The simplest solution is probably the most accurate. So I only mention that because you always, in any New Testament studies, if you take a class, a, a, any Bible, not a Bible class, but usually like at a secular university or a religion department or anything like that, you're going to read about Q. People are going to cite Q. They're going to talk about Q. They're going to have books on their shelves behind them as they're being interviewed that make them look very impressive and letters after their name, which make you think they know what they're talking about and everything, and they're going to be telling you about Q. But Q doesn't exist. It, there may have been an earlier document that had sayings of Jesus, that could, but there may have also been all kinds of things that we don't have any proof for. So it's just something to keep in mind. And it's how biblical scholarship works. Um, in, in most fields of study, to stay relevant, you have to come up with new stuff. To get a PhD, you have to come up with something new to write your dissertation on. In biblical studies, the temptation is always to find something new. But nine times out of ten in biblical studies, if you're finding something new, you're probably not on the right track. Because the goal is not to find something new, it's to remain faithful to the truth that was given. Um, so that's a temptation you see in biblical studies a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Did that not explain away the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit and God inspired work? Mm, would what explain it? Or what? Just to say, okay, Matthew and Luke got their stuff from Mark, who you know was around, and then or they got it from Q, or they got it from each other. Mm -hmm. No, because if, if you look back at or remember what we talked about last night, inspiration is God divinely supervising the authors to write down what he wanted written 
whether or not they use sources or, or compiled it to each other, or you'll see Paul uses a lot of extra biblical sources in some of his writings. He cites pagan poets to make a point. Um, the author of Jude cites a book of the Apocrypha to make his point. So it, it doesn't undermine inspiration in any way. To, because Luke even tells you in the beginning of Luke, I made it a priority to go around and find out about Jesus. I interviewed people. like So, so the New Testament authors definitely used sources. They didn't just make it up. Uh, but it's the question of how those sources relate to each other. None of it undermines, though. So you can, you can rest assured, if you are kind of, whoa, wait a minute, I don't know about this using sources thing. Um, the, the, biblical, the doctrine of inspiration never says that everything that every author wrote was unique to them. It says that everything they wrote was what God wanted to be written down. And so in, in this case, God probably wanted Matthew to Luke, use Luke and Mark and also Matthew's own eyewitness testimony and come up with his gospel. Uh, we stopped at the third point. So somebody read the fourth bullet point. Acts is the sequel to Luke's gospel, or Luke. Acts is the sequel to Luke. So, this is why if you're ever doing a small group Bible study or a Sunday school class, and the class says, hey, I want to study the Gospel of Luke, and you study Luke, make sure you study Acts as well. Because Acts is Luke 2. Luke part 2. It's one story in two different books. And, and, and the, in, in the putting together of the New Testament, um, there's nothing sacred about the order that the books are in our New Testament. We just know that they're all there and they're all inspired. And so the church grouped the Gospels together and they grouped Acts as something else. But Acts, I mean, it's the same author. And he tells you in the beginning of Acts, he says, My dear Theophilus, in the last book I wrote thus and such. He's talking about Luke. So Luke continues. And there's an overall theme in Luke and Acts involving Jesus and Caesar. And in the beginning of Luke, you have this, this family being basically pawns in, in Caesar's mighty empire where he calls a census and they have to move from their town and all of the wise men, all that stuff. And then in Acts ends with Paul taking the gospel to the heart of the Roman Empire, to Caesar's uh, palace himself. So it's an overarching story and, and Luke was, was not just recording random things that happened. Next bullet point. Thirteen books in the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul. Paul. Was once the church fierce enemy of the Christian world. Yes, Paul is seen as some people will call Paul the second founder of Christianity. The critics usually label that because they think that Jesus came along and taught stuff, and then Paul just wrote his own stuff and re, you know, re-imaged the whole Christian faith. And that's really popular to hear, but it, it does, it's it's not at all what you find when you read Paul. But Paul did write the most letters that we have of any single author in the New Testament. And so there's a good big chunk of the New Testament that's Paul's letters. Uh, the next one, I'll give you the first, I'll just read it, is five books are believed to be written by Jesus' disciple John. And they're John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. Now there's a little note there. There's a little footnote that takes you down to the bottom because not all of the books that, are, that are, are thought to be authored by John, only one of them claims to actually be written by John, and that's the book of Revelation. And that John doesn't even claim to be the Apostle John. He just says John. And John was just as common a name then as it is now. So a lot of scholars, biblical, evangelical, solid scholars, will say, it, it's not likely that John the Apostle, the disciple of Jesus, wrote all of these letters, but it's very likely that disciples and, and a school of, of people discipled by or influenced by John produced these works. You'll hear it argued that way sometimes. One scholar, Ben Witherington, who I've mentioned, I put a footnote there to a chapter from his book, What Have They Done With Jesus? He actually makes the case that in the Gospel of John, the author is only mentioned as the beloved disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's his name. And 
And Ben Witherington puts the pieces together and, and give, makes the case that, and I think it's a convincing case, that the only person in John's Gospel who's ever called by name the beloved disciple is Lazarus. When Jesus is told Lazarus is dying or dead or sick, it, they say, Lazarus, the one whom you love, is sick. And, and that's the only time anybody in John's Gospel is ever referred to as the one whom Jesus loves. And so Ben Witherington makes the case that John presents, the, the Gospel of John is really the eyewitness testimony of Lazarus as communicated to and written down by and edited together by John or one of John's disciples later in the process. So it's, it's interesting. It's not a, a doctrine-shattering decision either way, the traditional view that John wrote it and he's the beloved disciple, or the view that Lazarus is the beloved disciple and it's his testimony that's being preserved. Uh, either way is fine. The titles of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were not original to the Gospels. In other words, those titles were added later, not centuries later, but a few decades later. So you don't have to be dogmatic about which disciple or apostle wrote which gospel because they all circulated anonymously at the beginning. Because in theory, or supposedly, everybody knew who wrote it. This is, the, this is Matthew's gospel. Wait, he didn't need to put a title on it. We all know it came from Matthew. And so then later, the title got added. So it's, it's, you know, that this is what commentaries are for. If you want to really find out what, why should I believe, who wrote what gospel, pick up a commentary on that gospel, and in the beginning there should always be a section on authorship that deals with this. Let's look at the next one. Somebody read it. All of the New Testament at the book of Acts, with the exception of Revelation, consists of Epistles, E-P-I-S-T-L-E-S, -E or letters. Written by apostles and church leaders to various people or congregations. Yes, apostles write epistles. <coughs> epistles, it just means a letter. Now this is what's interesting. In the Old Testament, does anybody know how many epistles are in the Old Testament? Zero. There are no epistles in the Old Testament. Epistles are unique to the New Testament. When you're reading an epistle, you're reading one side of a conversation. It's like reading the mail, but only from one person. You don't get to read the other. Like, for instance, Paul mentions letters that the Corinthians write to him. But he doesn't. we don't have those letters. So he'll say things like, Now, about what you wrote to me about, this is what I have to say. And we have to piece together what they were writing to him about. So when we read the epistles, that's what makes studying the New Testament so much so much more challenging at times than studying the Old Testament, is we're only hearing one side of the conversation. Somebody take the next one. There are hundreds of quotes and allusions to the Old Testament, or you can just put the OT. In the New Testament. In the New Testament. Yeah. Hundreds of allusions. <coughs> The New Testament speaks the language of the Old Testament. They share a common vocabulary. Terms that we think of as uniquely Christian, like the word church, is an Old Testament term. Church is just the, the, the word that the Old Testament used to describe the congregation of Israel, the people of Israel. In the Old Testament, they were the church of Israel. They just translated it in English as congregation rather than church. But it's the equivalent word. It's the same thing. All of the language of predestination, election, sanctification, these are all Old Testament terms. But Christians, usually we just don't know as much about the Old Testament, so we think they all came around in the New Testament. But it is all, all thoroughly Old Testament in origin. And the last one, I will read this one. This is the most important. Your salvation hinges on getting this right. Jesus will not be pleased with you on the day of judgment if you don't get this right. There is no S on the end of Revelation. There is no book of Revelations. Whenever you start to hear an expert talk about the book of Revelations, you can rest assured that they are not an expert in the book of Revelation. No. If you can't get the title of the book right, then don't write a book about it. Okay, the book of Revelation. And it's actually, the title of Revelation is The Revelation of Jesus Christ to John. Alright, so it is the Revelation, singular, 
not Revelation. Yeah, you'd be surprised. There was a great, uh, there's a, a Zondervan put out an amazingly done, high quality audio version of the Bible over the last couple of years called the, the Bible Experience. It was the TNIV Bible and it was read by a ton of popular African American actors and actresses. I mean, famous Denzel Washington and Oprah read some passages and Samuel Jackson and just all of these, I mean, a who's who of actors from the black community provided the voices. And it, it's a really, really good audio Bible. I like it a lot. Except when they say, the book of Revelations. <laughs> and I just wanted to throw the CD out the window. I couldn't believe it. Um, it's just a pet peeve of mine, but I wrote this course, so now it can be your pet peeve too. <laughs> Revelation, singular. All right, well, let's look at these books on page 34. And we're going to do what we did with the Old Testament, which is we're not going to read all of them. We're just going to give you the overview. Page 34 is the New Testament in a nutshell. The first section is the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I include Acts in here with Luke Acts. So you can see that that's what it is. It's not missing. Once we get past the Gospels and Acts in the New Testament, then we come to Paul's letters or Paul's epistles. Whichever way you want to say it. And that's Romans all the way through the book of Philemon. Or Philemon, however you want to pronounce it. Now, in Paul's letters, all of his letters up to 1 Timothy were written to congregations. But 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are written to individuals. Those are called the pastoral epistles. He writes to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. So those have a very personal feel, and they're a lot shorter than the other letters. After Paul's letters, on page 36, we come to the general epistles, or the general letters. And that's what begins with Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter. And these are called the general epistles because Paul didn't write them. They're everybody else's. Hebrews is the only book in the New Testament where the authorship is and has almost always been unknown. From the very, very earliest times in church history, it was known that Hebrews was written by one of the apostles, but it wasn't known exactly which one wrote it. So a number of people, or it got somehow in the tradition that Paul wrote it, and it, that's why it came to be placed right after Paul's letters, because there's the possibility that he wrote it. Now, reading Hebrews, it makes it pretty clear that it was anybody except Paul because the author of Hebrews talks about the faith that was handed on to him from eyewitnesses of Jesus. Whereas Paul goes out of his way to say in all his letters, he was an eyewitness to Jesus and he didn't get the faith handed on to someone else. So it's very likely that Hebrews was not written by Paul, but written by, and people have put in um, suggestions, everybody from Lazarus to Apollos to whoever. Um, for that, again, you'd have to go to the Hebrews commentaries and see what the scholars say. One thing to clarify, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, those are all different, obviously, than the Gospel of John. And those are the books of the Bible, especially 1st John, where the word love appears more than any other book, more than any other book of the Bible, you see the word love in John. In fact, 1st John is called... Uh, or 1 John is called the Apostle of Love because he uses that word more um, statistically than any other biblical author. And John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation share a very common vocabulary and, and, and written in a very similar style, which is very low Greek. Like, if you want to learn Greek and read easy Greek, usually you're told to read John or some of John's letters because the Greek that John has written in is very low on the reading scale. Is that Koine? Yeah, it's all in Koine Greek, but it was a very easy version of Koine Greek, whereas Hebrews is very high level of reading. And the rhetoric and, and, and the, the grammar and everything in Hebrews is still in Koine Greek, but it's just, it's harder to translate if you're a first year Greek student Hebrews than it is John. So, for what that's worth. The last section, after Jude, is the book of Revelation. And this is an apocalyptic epistle. It's its own category. 
or an apocalyptic letter. And the reason is because apocalypse is a genre of writing. There's, there's an actual genre of writing known as apocalyptic or apocalypse. And Revelation is written in that genre. But Revelation is also addressed to seven churches. And it has a, a greeting and an ending. So it, it has some marks of an epistle as well. Some marks of a letter. So it's kind of a hybrid. Apocalyptic, I'll talk for a second about it. It comes from a Greek, the Greek word apocalypsis, which means to unveil, to lift the veil off of, or to reveal. That's where we get the name revelation. It's the unveiling of what Jesus is doing. And it's given to John. So it's the revelation, the apocalypsis of John. And apocalyptic is a genre of writing that has well-defined and well-understood uh, characteristics to it. If we, if we understand apocalyptic as a genre, then we're able to make sense of a lot of stuff in Revelation and other apocalyptic writings that just seem odd on the surface. The Old Testament is where apocalyptic begins. You first find apocalyptic symbolism in imagery in passages or books like Zechariah and in Daniel especially. <coughs> And then throughout the intertestamental period, the period between Malachi and when Jesus came on the scene, there's a number of apocalypses that were written during that time. And even after Revelation, there were apocalypses that were written. But you can, you can get all of these books that didn't make it in the Bible that people wonder about. You can buy them in any, you can order them. Uh, the, the false gospels and, and the pseudepigraphic writings and things like that. But apocalypse is a genre of writing. Apocalyptic writings are used symbols, images, numbers, in order to portray the reality that exists behind the visible world. And they're almost always written to the persecuted. And apocalyptic imagery, apocalyptic genre, uses cosmic imagery, uh, imagery of huge epic proportions, and it uses mythical imagery, imagery from the culture, things like dragons and horns and beasts and all of these things. Uh, it uses hybrid animals, these weird combinations, something that was like a leopard, but it had wings, and it was like this, but it had horns and iron teeth. And it uses all these symbols in order to speak very clearly to the people who are reading it, to let them know what's really going on in the world, to give them assurance and to comfort them. That's the last point is that needs to be written. Written to the persecuted to comfort. And comfort. encourage. Them. How would a monster it comfort me? When you read that this monster that is persecuting and destroying God's people is going to be picked up and thrown into a burning lake of fire forever, and those people are going to be raised up and restored to righteousness, and you know that you're one of those people, then it gives you the ability to endure the trials of the monstrous empire that you're under. When you see Rome, the height of Rome in all of its glory and splendor, that brags to the entire world about ushering in peace and security to the whole world and civilizing the world, portrayed as a drunken harlot that's gorging herself on the blood of God's people and is going to get what she deserves, then when you are persecuted by Rome for being a Christian, you're able to stand up to it in the face of it and say, you know what, you are presenting yourself as the goddess Roma who is full of wisdom and literature and culture, but you are really a drunken harlot in God's eyes and you're persecuting the people of God and you are going to be judged and I will be vindicated. So I'm going to remain faithful. And that's applicable to today? That was applicable to the Christians that got Revelation and it's been applicable to suffering Christians ever since then in the face of institutional evil. The, the irony about apocalyptic is that it was originally written to make things clear. That's the irony. And in our day and age, it's most Christians stay away from Revelation. Or they have an unhealthy fascination with it and try to peg every current event and try to match it up to what's going on in Revelation. 
And the truth is somewhere in the middle. Revelation was written to first century Christians, but Revelation was also given to the church universal. And so it has to be applicable to every generation. If Revelation was just written about events that are going to happen in the year 20-whatever, then that means that for the last 2,000 years, it has not had any true meaning to the Christians who've lived and died since then. But if Revelation was written about events that were happening in 70, 80, 90 AD and on, and had enduring application to later events that would happen as far as just in general, the way evil manifests itself in the world and persecutes God's people, then it would have significance to every Christian for all time. And that's what we find in apocalyptic writings, particularly in Revelation. Yep. Okay, so that is an overview of the New Testament. Again, not this, this, this course isn't an exhaustive you know, walk through the Bible, but it's just to give you a flyover and just so you can see and kind of get your bearings where you are whenever you're reading the Bible.